Good morning. It's a big binder. There we go. Can I get there? Perfect. <laughs> Happy long weekend. I had to look up what the long weekend actually was for. Usually I just take the day off and go, all right, but happy early BC day. Awesome. Some people are probably off camping right now on a little bit of a quick trip. So if you're watching this on Monday and Tuesday, hello, hope you had a great time. And of course, with the long weekend for a lot of people comes traveling, Uh, traveling to a campsite, go visit relatives, whatever that may be. And I think there comes a time when you're traveling where we all face that classic moral dilemma. When you're driving and you look to the side of the road and you see that annoying white sign with those numbers on it, and you're like, that's pretty slow. I know a lot of people I know call it more of a speed suggestion rather than a limit. I'm sure you've heard that as well. It's one of those things where I know what I should be doing right now, but I can go a little faster. I can get to my destination maybe one minute quicker, and then woohoo, we did it. There's always that but in there. I know what I need to be doing. I know what I should be doing, but I don't really want to. And if you recall last week, uh, we were going through the sayings of Jesus, and Pastor Rich Uh, His saying was, Jesus saying, as he sent me, so I send you. And it was a Sunday where we focused a lot on missions and uh, all that that entails. And I'm going to be looking at another saying of Jesus found in Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. And this is another saying that motivates us towards being on mission. Because the Great Commission, as we talked about last week, applies to us all. Jesus, as he ascended into heaven, said, go and make disciples of all nations. And he's telling all of us to do that. There is no ifs, ands, and buts. It's not a suggestion like you might look at the speed limit. The only variable is the location. Where are you going to do that? It might be in a far-off land. It might be here in our local community. That's great. But how can we be effective on mission? How can we be strong workers for the gospel? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And Jesus gives example and instruction in Matthew 9 verses 35 to 38 on how we are to be on mission every day of our lives. And it's not a profound answer. It's not a profound statement, but a simple one. And that's sometimes the best because it leaves no room for that if, and, or but. But it's just there and unavoidable for us to have to follow. He tells his disciples and those around him that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's pray. Lord, as we look today in your word, what you said in your time here on earth, may you grow our hearts for you, God. And may you help us see just the need and the urgency that there is in this world, that there is a harvest out there. May you motivate us as your workers to go out and be faithful to gathering and reaping that harvest. In your name, amen. We're going to start in verse 35 and 36. And the first thing we're going to look at is Jesus' motivation and who Jesus was and how he acted towards the people that he was with. In verse 35, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospels of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. To be workers, we need compassion. Did you catch that? Look what Jesus modeled. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. And one of the first things that we notice and see about Jesus in how he acted out his compassion is that he went to the hard areas. He went to the areas and the people that a lot of the religious leaders that time steered a wide berth around. 
very clear of. The Samaritans, tax collectors, demon-possessed, prostitutes, the poor and the sick like lepers. All of these people that the Pharisees, scribes, religious leaders would avoid, Jesus went to because he had compassion. He did not let judgment stop his ministry. And he had every right to because he was God. He was so far above these people and just their mess that they were in. He knew every sin that they had ever committed and every sin that they ever would commit. Yet he chose to still love them, to still uh, show them compassion and come alongside them and heal them, eat with them, which is incredible. And this is the same compassion that Jesus showed you and me. This immense love, this immense compassion that we do not deserve. But Jesus showed it anyway. And there's a clear contrast between Jesus and the religious leaders of the time. Because Jesus was so far and above. And then you have these religious leaders, these men, imperfect human beings, yet they're the ones who showcase moral superiority. They're the ones who look to the poor, the sick, Samaritans, ah, tax collectors, whatever. And they say, wow, I am better than you. <laughs> you suck. I'm so great. In Luke 18, 11, Jesus tells a story and says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And there's this clear contrast between the imperfect, sinful Pharisees who thought they were so far and above, who were filled with pride, and Jesus, who is God, who created the heavens and the earth, yet just the humbleness and the compassion and love that he showed to those who did not receive the love from the religious leaders. And so often we find ourselves in the same camp as those Pharisees. There's a lot of hard people in this world. There's a lot of people that we don't like going to. Homeless, drug addicts, and there's many others. People who live lifestyles that we don't agree with. And as today's culture veers farther and farther away from biblical truth, it can become so easy for us as Christians to be like the Pharisees and have this sense of moral superiority saying, I am so much better than the rest of the world. I'm so much better than this person and this person and this person. But why do we do that when not even Jesus did that? Jesus treated everyone with compassion. He treated the lowly with compassion. So even if we don't agree with the way someone lives or we don't really like being around someone, that gives us no right for this moral superiority. 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul writes, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And he doesn't mean go and indulge in sin to be one of the non-believers. No. But what he's saying is take that first step enter into their lives because we can't just stand there and expect them to come to us and enter into our lives. Be filled with that compassion and like Jesus, go to those hard areas, those harder people. Guard yourself from that pride and that moral superiority of thinking that you're better than someone because you're not. We're all imperfect humans and Jesus saved us. That gives us no right to cast judgment upon those but it should be more motivation for us to show the compassion and the love that we had received. Because the people are like sheep without shepherds, it says at the tail end of verse 36. They were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And sheep are a very common imagery in the Bible. And quite often, sheep are compared to us, to human beings, because they're not really well known for being the smartest. They kind of go off and do their own thing, and next thing they know, they're lying upside down starving, or they've wandered into a wolf's den, or whatever, or off a cliff. That's us. <laughs> but that's how Jesus viewed these people as lost. And the Pharisees, the scribes, the Levites, they were supposed to be their guides, 
but they didn't have compassion. So Jesus was compassionate. He didn't have that moral superiority. He's called the good a shepherd, a shepherd who loves and protects his sheep. So where are we in this when we look to the lost sheep? Do we have that moral superiority or do we have that compassion? Oftentimes we might look at ourselves and be like, oh, we're the junior shepherds to the good shepherd. We got Jesus, he's the good shepherd, and then we're the junior shepherds doing our own thing, helping him out. There's a bit of a flaw with that picture and that thought because when you're a junior shepherd, the good shepherd can kind of go off and leave things to you and you can take care of it. It's more like we're his sheepdogs. Right? We're an animal just like the sheep, but we've been tamed and we've been trained by the good shepherd and now being used by the good shepherd in his ministry so that when a sheep is going off, we can run over and wrangle it in and help direct it towards the good shepherd while still being totally in the service and relying on the good shepherd. It takes a great deal of compassion to deal with sheep. And may we have that as we look towards the great shepherd. Because Jesus was motivated by compassion, so should we. And there's a fancy long Greek word for the word compassion that I'm not going to pronounce for sake of embarrassment. <laughs> but what it means in its essence is almost a deep, like internal pain, like in the depths of your stomach. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life, where you've seen something that someone's going to, maybe it's someone very close to you, a loved one, a child, and you have this compassion that's so deep it almost brings you to pain. I know for myself, I had the opportunity to serve and work at an orphanage in Mexico. And I remember the first time that I'd heard everything that those children had gone through, the abuse that they had faced in their homes at such a, such a young age, this feeling that I had of compassion and hurt. That's what we should have with every single person that's lost. Because that's the feeling that Jesus had as he looked upon these crowds. These lost crowds that were wandering astray without a guide, without a shepherd. We should be motivated by compassion, not obligation. Yes, we're commanded in the Great Commission to go out and make disciples of all nations. But we shouldn't just do that because, I guess we have to. No, we should do it because we want to. Because we look out to the world and we see the messiness of the world and it hurts. We have a deep sense of compassion because we want them to come to Jesus and experience Jesus just as we have. The most effective workers are not the ones who have to be there, who every two minutes are checking their watch and at quarter to 11 are already going on their lunch break or really planning out how to stretch out their time so they can go to lunch early. No, the most effective workers are the ones who actually want to be there, who are motivated, who are caught up in the vision of the company. And that's what we need to be. We need to put ourselves in their shoes. No one wants someone, someone to come to them with a sense of moral superiority saying, hey, I'm so much better than you. Don't you want to be like me? Except Jesus. No one wants to hear that. People want the compassion and that love. I think we as a church need to remember that. As we're going out to be workers in the harvest, may it be one motivated by compassion and love. Don't try to scare people into Jesus, but show, Jesus, show them who Jesus is and how Jesus has changed you. So in verse 37, you have kind of the main statement that Jesus says. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. To be workers, we need to realize there is a great need. The opportunity is great, yet so often the urgency is not. The urgency is lacking. It's like if you had a beautiful apple tree outside, You've been waiting and waiting until finally the apples are ripe and ready. The harvest is there. The harvest is there for you outside. But it's also a little sunny out, a little hot. I don't like sweating, so I'll put it off to the next day. 
The next day it's raining. Okay, I don't want to do that. Well, I don't want to go outside while it's raining. The next day it's still raining because it's Vancouver Island. And maybe it's raining for a couple more days. So more and more you put it off, you put it off until one day it's ready. The harvest is there. You go outside and the apples are moldy and rotten and infested with worms. The opportunity is great, but so often the urgency is not. So often we can find ourselves putting it off to the next day. Oh, I don't know if they really want to talk about Jesus. Maybe if they initiate, then I will. And all these excuses that I've certainly felt in my life, and I'm sure many of you have, that voice in your head saying, maybe not, that you put it off and you put it off and you put it off. But do you believe that people are going to hell? Do you believe that that's at stake? Because if you do, you should be motivated and urgent because you don't know how long someone has. Because one day they may be here and one day they're not. How much must you hate someone to just sit back and watch them go off in their current trajectory towards hell? When you have the words, you have the gospel of truth that can save them. So don't put it off. Maybe you'll have to get outside in the rain and it might not be comfortable. It might not be your favorite thing. But there's so much at stake. So realize there's this great need. And sharing the gospel, being workers, is work. (laughs) It takes work to be a worker. It's not easy to share the gospel. It is an effort. And you know what? You may get rejected, and that's okay. Because it may just be planting the seed in someone's life. Right? The growth cycle of a plant can be slow. Sometimes all you'll do is plant a seed, and then 30 years later, someone might come up to you and say, wow, because of that little seed you planted in my life, 10 years ago, someone was able to reap that harvest. So be motivated. Be at work because the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is there and ready, but we need to have that motivation. We need to have that action. It's like in an early morning, if I'm going to pick up some coffee from a Starbucks or Tim Hortons or wherever you get your coffee, and I'm in line, and I look outside, and there's an elderly person crossing the road and barreling towards them as a drunk driver. I have plenty of time, I think, so I'm already pretty far up the line. It is the morning. I need my coffee in the morning, so I'll go. I'll order a black coffee because I don't know any of the other words at Starbucks. Get my coffee. Hope my name's spelt right. Okay, now I'm going to go help that person. Oh, too late. That person's gone. And of course, that's an over the top picture, yet so often it can be like that for us. Where we're in that lineup and we see the urgency, we see someone, the harvest is plentiful, it's ready. We'll think about ourselves first, our own comfort, and put that off. I'll take care of it later. We don't know if there's going to be a later. Because God chooses to save the lost through those that were lost. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Because all of us were once lost. We are all like those sheep wandering astray, yet Jesus saved us. And now we can go and basically say how Jesus saved us and what that means. Sometimes it's our job to sow while others will do the reaping. Or maybe we'll get the reaping. But what matters is that the harvest is plentiful. It's there. But the workers are few. And why are the workers few? Because there are so many that don't see the urgency of it. There are so many workers who are calling in sick or who are looking outside and it's raining or it's really warm on the, I'll put it off. I'll take care of it another day. Church, may that not be us. May we be motivated to be workers 24-7, no matter how uncomfortable it may make us. Uh, The dean of men in my college would always describe it as being the hands and feet of Jesus where everything that you do, every step you take, every action that you do is so obviously just different. So obviously just emanating Jesus, the compassion that he showed, so that people look to us and they just know there's something different. 
That's part of being a worker. So realize there's a great need. To be workers, we need to realize there's a great need out there. We need to be urgent. And lastly, let's look at verse 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. To be workers, we need to pray for God to send workers. And there's, Jesus had previously raised up this problem of the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Yet he gives such a simple answer. There's no deep, profound answer. His answer is simply pray for more workers. Pray for more to be worked. Pray for more to feel that compassion. Pray for more to feel and see that urgency. Pray for people to work at the church, to volunteer at our programs. We've got summer day camps coming up in the next two weeks. Be praying for that. Praying that a mighty harvest will be there. Pray for those who volunteer with our youth group, uh, with our many other ministries. Pray for the Christian organizations and charities locally. And pray that people will go and feel called to serve overseas and serve as missionaries. Pray for boldness. Pray that people won't be scared. Pray that they'll have that urgency and that compassion for the lost. Pray for God to send people, to send workers, because we need reinforcements in the harvest. But also be prepared to be an answer to that prayer. If every single person in this room, if we all bowed our heads, and prayed, God, send workers. Yet none of us went out to be a worker. What was the point? Be prepared to be an answer to that prayer. If you're praying, God, I've got this coworker. I think they need you. Please send someone into their lives. He already has. You. So be prepared to be an answer to that prayer. Isaiah 6, 8 is such a beautiful verse. The prophet Isaiah is in the presence of God. Angels are out singing holy, holy, holy towards God. And in verse 6, 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. May that be our prayer. As we look to the world around us, the problem is that we look to God and say, Here I am. Send me. I don't know where you want to send me, but just send me. May that be the prayer that you have. We're all called to be on mission, right? We've all been sent into the world. And there are a lot of excuses that may come up. Surely I can't be a worker. I don't know all the answers. I don't know everything. What if they ask a question that I just don't know the answer to? guess what? No one knows all the answers. Whether or not you're yay big or you're far past retirement, you don't know all the answers. So that's just going to be an excuse that keeps putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Be humble and sometimes say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. And then find out, find someone who does or pray about it, research it, whatever that may be. But don't use that as an excuse because you'll never know all the answers. The Samaritan woman, after talking with Jesus at the well, knew nothing that she brought an entire village to Jesus. Sometimes the most effective people are those who have just become Christians and they're just so filled with joy and they almost have like a childlike enthusiasm where they don't care about what other people think. They're just so excited, filled with compassion for their friends because they want their friends to experience and find Jesus as they had. So what you should know is that Jesus saved you, right? We all should know the gospel, at least the very basics, because the gospel is what saved you. You should know what saved yourself. So saying that you don't know all the answers is not a valid excuse. It's like you're going for a walk with someone, and all of a sudden they collapse. They stop breathing. You call 911, and 911 says, okay, can you administer CPR to them? I'm not a doctor. I I can't. I'm not trained and equipped medically to do that. I'm just going to stand back. Someone else who's more trained, who's more equipped, will come and take care of it. Then it's too late. And I know I've been using 
a lot of illustrations that are more on the morbid side today. And that's intentional because lives are at stake. And these ridiculous analogies and examples that I have are so often what we use to validate our laziness. I don't know everything, so I'll wait until someone else who's educated comes along. Or, oh, I, I, I have these personal needs that I want to take care of first, then I'll deal with them. Lives are at stake. And eternity is at stake for so many people. So church, may we be working 24-7 as workers. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But may it be said for us, Courtney Fellowship Baptist Church, may it be said of us that the harvest is plentiful and so are the workers. That every single person in this room or watching from home, that we can go out filled with compassion, showing the love of Jesus to the world, going to those hard areas, the people that you might not want to go to, but going to them nonetheless because they still need Jesus. They're sheep wandering astray. Knowing the need, seeing that there's a great urgency out there and praying for workers and for ourselves to be workers and to be equipped. The harvest is plentiful. What are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for sending your son and for his death on the cross to save each and every one of us. Thank you. And thank you that you've given us the commission now to go out and make disciples of all the nations. Lord, protect us from the influence of Satan, wanting us to be lazy, to put it off for another day, or to doubt ourselves. No. The harvest is plentiful, Lord, and thank you that the harvest is plentiful. But God, may you raise up workers in this church to go and be a light in the darkness, whether that's here in Courtney or that's in some far-off nation. God, may we be serving you. The harvest is plentiful. And Lord, may you send workers to that harvest. Amen.